Hey folks, thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Coming Up Next. It's episode 161 with the writer-director of The Black Balloon, Alyssa Down. Before we get into that interview, why don't you head to comingupnext.com.au. You'll find the entire back catalogue of Podcast Rambles on that website. You'll also find links to iTunes, to Stitcher and to Podbean where you can subscribe to the show, rate the show and review the show. It's the best thing that you can do to help support the show that comes at you for free each and every week. All right. Let's get into it. What's going on, friends? Welcome to another ramble. Welcome to another podcast. Welcome to another episode of Coming Up Next. That's my podcast. I'm Alistair Marks. And uh, thank you to Kevin Clobber for joining me on the show last week. Kevin is the editor of Academy Award winning documentary Icarus, uh, which is just a tremendous piece of filmmaking. Kevin uh, came on the show and pulled the curtain down quite significantly, actually, on the process of putting the film together. If you haven't checked it out, comingupnext.com.au is going to be the best place to do that, along with the entire back catalogue of podcast rambles available to you for nada now uh an often spoken about trope on this podcast and it seems like a little bit of a uh, a cliche i guess to even talk about but uh for me anyway it often gets kind of lost in the woodwork and that's the idea that whenever we're creating uh writing or um or directing or constructing a performance or or painting wh- whatever whatever it may be whatever your art discipline of choice is it's this idea that you know we're only ever creating from our own experiences that we're um we're always looking at things through the filters of uh, of of how we've experienced life and i think that someone uh who has really put that into practice and kind of put herself into her work particularly with uh with her film with her debut feature film the black balloon is uh, is Alyssa down uh Alyssa came on the show uh about a month ago we we had a really great chat about the process of putting that together about uh moving over to los angeles starting to pursue dual careers both in uh, in la and and in australia um or in the states and in australia uh, and about uh, you know moving moving through a career um, post black balloon, we get into all that. We get into the usual stuff, and uh, let's get into it right now. <laughs> How long ago did you move to Los Angeles? Uh, first came out here 2008. Right. And so that would have been just after the black balloon had sort of yes. blown up, so to speak? Yes. Yeah, that's basically what happened. Um, uh, the agency Endeavor, which is now merged to become WME, um, they represented Tony Collette. And I think that's how they found out about the film and just won it Berlin, came over, signed with them. And yeah, that's sort of the trajectory of uh, what happened. Wow. That's a pretty remarkable turnaround for, you know, something that would have started out as this really, I imagine, quite grassroots film that you were just compelled to make. Oh, definitely. I had no idea that I would be going to America. It was just about making this film and making the best possible film I could make. And I remember my mission statement was like, just nail the emotions and the performance and you can walk away with your head held high. That was sort of (laughs) the bar I set for the film. I didn't want to go, oh, and I want to get into a festival or get this type of release. It was just like, that's what I wanted to set as my creative intention because everything else you have no control over. And then when I made it, I was so happy because it was like, that's exactly what I set out to make. And then everything on top was 
you know, little sprinkles and delightful things. Yeah, it's quite brilliant the the way that you're talking about having framed the process of making the film, I guess, because it then, I suppose, if you're having like a mission statement with, you know, quotation marks or a, a really strong intention would kind of drive everything, I, I would imagine, to be really deliberate and really specific with what you're what you're doing collaboratively. Yeah, I think so. And I try and approach my, uh, my projects like that because you can worry and stress about things that you have no control over. The only thing you can control is what you're doing on your side of the fence. And so I'm just very conscious of like, okay, what can I do? What, you know, cause, and each project is different. Like the honor list, which I just did, you know, was a smaller budget. We shot in 20 days. And so it was just like, okay, the, you know, and it happened so quickly. So there was a different set of expectations I had in my mission statement just because I was like, okay, this is this type of film and let's, you know, different from the black balloon. And so, and it's the same with other things that I'm either writing or making, just set up a little intention. So you feel like you've achieved something at the other end of it. I noticed that uh, you'd made, before the black balloon, you'd made 10, 10 short films. Is that right? Yes. Yes, that sounds about right. And uh, and you know you there's this kind of through line that you were or have always felt compelled by filmmaking as a storytelling medium. Um, do you remember the first time that you did tell a story or or were involved in this that kind of collaborative way of storytelling? Oh, that's interesting. Um, bef- so before filmmaking. Uh... Like, I was that annoying kid. I used to order my mum around at story time and direct the type of voice <laughs> that she would do it. Be like, Mum, the, the giant's got a gruff voice and Jack has a little squeaky voice. And it was this whole production of my poor mother reading to me. And then that just rolled into, you know, primary school where I was putting on plays same in high school, but then I started uh, – our school had film and television, and that was fantastic. Wow, that's incredible. And got to – yeah, I mean, we were using some, you know, VHS, you know, technology, <laughs> and but it was just great. And you're working with your friends and you're – you know, you've got big ideas, but, of course, no budget and your friends being these actors <laughs> – that you would like and it was sort of fun and then cutting to university got to study film and television at uh, Curtin University and and got to like we were one of the last group to shoot on film and because I know after we went through because we learned to cut on the steam back wow. then after that they had the medium 100s come through and i'm actually really grateful that i learned to cut on film because that comes in handy when the shit hits the fan you sort of flash back to i have 200 feet of short ends and how do i put together a scene and that background has always helped me out when you know you're up against the wall it's like, oh, yeah, I've been here before <laughs> and I know how to get out of it. Yeah, I suppose having that kind of grounding would certainly make you more, uh, I guess, efficient with your the way that you're approaching things. Definitely. And I think just uh, touching film and splicing it to another piece of film, I don't know, there's something quite you're physically putting together a film and I think that just really sort of fused into my psyche. Like if I put this shot next to that shot and you stick it together and I think you really learn that sort of fundamentals of how a scene gets put together. And it really, and that I really felt helped me as a director because when I think of things, I, literally like okay that shot will cut to that shot will cut to that shot and it really just helps me um 
you know, approach a scene and have that confidence that I'll have something at the other end and I don't hate myself in the editing room like, oh, why didn't I get that close up? Or, <laughs> oh, my God, I don't have a shot that's going to glue those scenes together. No! So you went to Curtin University. That's in Perth, right? Yes. And you, you grew up in that neck of the woods as well. No, I'm an army brat. Right. So schooling was both in um, Sydney and Queensland. So I went to uh, three primary schools and two high schools. So, um, but the majority of all of my high school was done in Queensland. And then at the end of grade 12, uh, we moved to Perth. Right. So what was it like growing up? I guess as a bit of a gypsy with this creative passion, did you find it difficult or did you did it seem a bit more seamless to be moving around? Uh, moving around was always tough because you'd just be like, oh, you know, so devastated. Like when you found out, oh, we're moving and you always got a few months notice so you would know, oh, okay, at the end of the year I have to leave my friends. And that was always tough. And just sad because you were looking down the barrel of, oh, how can I have fun? Because at the end of the year, <laughs> you know, this is going to be mm. happening. <laughs> and and then you would move and then you would arrive at this new place. And then it's like, oh, that's right. I have to make new friends. And, and also with my family background, with um, – two of my three brothers having autism it's like oh yes and here's also my very unique and different family um, that you now have right. to be introduced to so it was also uh introducing people to things that were not atypical so it must have been uh, very <laughs> colorful different i suppose for, for you from your point of view in like you say you know having um having to explain or bed in a new group of people into your unique family life? No, definitely. And it has set me up for a life as a filmmaker where every project is a new set of people. And like, hi, you know, like we don't have this steady uh, work environment where it's like you're working. You, I mean, you can work with the same people, but you're not, you know, there's always going to be a whole bunch of new people involved. And it's like, oh, okay. And I remember working on Confess, the the series um, I made for Go Ninety, and I, you know, just working on a set where I hadn't worked with these people before. It was like, wow, it was sort of like <laughs> starting school again, you know, like, oh, this is right. I know this feeling. And other times it's, you know, you can have a few people that you know. But that experience of film sets of just different people all the time and day one's like, oh, okay, this is this is my family for however long that you're shooting for. Yeah. I guess it, having that experience growing up as well probably would have given you a, a much stronger sense of like being present to what is in front of you there and then as opposed to thinking about the future probably not consciously at that age but mm. in terms of setting you up for to have that kind of framing or mentality about life and the way that you were working or relating to other people no definitely and i think it's one of the things that made moving to the u.s so much easier because i have moved i've moved across Australia all the time and just picked up and like, you know, I did that from Perth to Sydney as well, like leave my, my network and my support group in Perth to move to Sydney to, to further my career. And so when you did that all the time growing up, it's less scary. It's like, okay, I've done this before. I know what it is where, you know, I know with some people, um, you know, they've been, it was, it's a harder thing and some people don't move because it's like, but this is where I went to primary school and high school and, you know, and yeah. went to university here or they might move for university and, you know, it's the idea of sort of packing up and distilling all your belongings into a few suitcases and starting again can be quite intimidating for a lot of people. That's true. What? How would you, have you ever uh, kind of had to, 
either coax or coach anyone into doing something like that? I've spoken to a few people about it and, um, yeah, I think, but they're the people that tend to be a bit ready for it. Like yeah. they're, they're teetering and they need to just get a little bit of confidence to take that step um, because I think there's other people that's like, nope, this is, this is my little spot of earth and I'm going to stay there and this is what I want to do. But, you know, then often you have different Goals, I don't know, but uh, it seems to be the people that, you know, are like, I'm thinking about this, is it possible? What do I need to, what do I need to do? And they might take a longer run up. It might take them a couple of years where for me to come to the US was something that happened in six weeks. <laughs> and it was like, <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> okay, I'm packing up my shit. Okay, how yeah. is this all going to work out? From one extreme to the other. Yeah, definitely. So your mum was uh, directed with um, with the voices that she had to do for story time. Were your yes. parents? Did your parents acquiesce to your demands, or was there resistance, or were they were, were they very supportive of your kind of um, uh, blossoming creativity? I think they always. I mean, mum, bless her, did all the voices and. Uh, you know, sort of put up with, I spent, like my, I remember my great grandparents always putting up with whenever we came to visit my plays that I would put on because they just like, Oh, let's just she's putting on a play, you know? So they always got a little excited. So I had a little out there outlet there. And I think it was like at school, um, my parents were supportive of picking film and television and theater and art and all those as subjects whereas there was a lot of my school friends who wanted to do certain subjects but, but their parents wouldn't let them and they had to do, like, you know, the mat, you know, like business and, you know, all those sort of subjects which, you know, they didn't want to do and that were being sort of, you know, groomed to do a certain degree at university. And um, it was the same at university it was like okay she's she's doing this i don't think they were like like yay my daughter's <laughs> studying an arts degree I don't, they weren't uh, you know i will say they weren't that they weren't like shaking the the banners going oh, i'm swelling with parental pride my daughter's doing an arts degree um but that's also because of their background like I know on my dad's side of the family, I was the first female to go to university. So that was a right. whole, you know, that was a whole different thing. And so, yeah, and it's because they didn't know you could actually have a career. It was just something like, oh, arts, what are you doing, arts? Like, that's, you know, that sort of Nancy stuff. Like, it just, it was so beyond them. And then, you know, I'd, you know, we're finding out things of like what people can earn and all this and I'd drop that into dad and he was like, oh, oh, oh okay, you know, oh, right, yeah. like just thinking that in. And then when I, and then I think mum was always just having this dream like, oh, she'll end up being a teacher. You know, she'll you she'll be an arts teacher. You yeah, know, I yeah. think that was mum sort of like, and you, she can do her film stuff in the holidays, you know, that type of, yeah. so I think. That was her little cushioning. And then when I started, you know, making films and then some of my, I think there was a turning point because I remember there was a little difference and I don't know, I think it might have been a news, you know, a local news little article or something because uh, I was getting nominated for Young Filmmaker of the Year or something and I think they'd compared something to Jane Campion or something like that, you know, just... You know, I mean, not a lot of originality. It's like female director, female director, <laughs> I shall compare them, you know. And they were like, oh, Jane Campion, like she's won an Oscar. Like they just, and I think it was that difference of like, oh, people, you know, she's being written about in a newspaper. And I think that was that sort of turning point of like, oh, okay, let's, let's see where this goes. And then everything started to unfold. So, yeah, there was never any resistance it was just like hmm i'm not sure about this filmmaking caper of which you speak yeah <laughs> i can uh, i can certainly relate um and i remember as you were talking about that my mum actually 
saying to me, why don't you do, because I also studied film and television, um, sh- my mum saying to me, why don't you yes. do is it a, a diploma of education as well? And then, yes. and then, then you can that teach. Did. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, that same speech yeah. came to me. Uh, and you know what was interesting? I actually was going to have an, uh, a meeting about it. Like I just went, oh, okay, I'll go meet you know I had that booked in and I got a letter out of the blue from a friend of mine I had not heard from her in four years and I opened the letter and she's like I got your address from so and so etc etc and that was the first paragraph the next page and a half was that she just finished doing her teacher degree and how she hated it and how she would rather wash tables at KFC (laughs) and I was like and I just read recently read the Celestine prophecy that talks about signs. And I went, oh, that's a sign. <laughs> and I just went, and I didn't go to that meeting. I just took that as like, okay, she, you know, this person I hadn't heard from in four years has sent me a couple of page rant of how much she despised her teaching degree. So I went, okay, I'm not going to do that. Let's put a pin um, in that one. My, uh, and we're done. But ironically, I've, you know, I've taught all the time over the years. I've been, uh, been brought in um, as a, you know, lecturer or a tutor or something like that. So I do find that quite ironic. Yeah. Yeah, I, rem- I, I remember another point uh, probably about 10 years ago where I was looking into doing like a, a, a postgrad law degree or something. I think I was getting a bit fed up with uh, not having very much money in my bank account and yes. the uh the the joy from my from my mother and father at the prospect of me going to do that was <laughs> quite palpable so the disappointment when i never followed through with it must have been um equally <laughs> <laughs> well i think it's tough on parents of a particular generation because there's all these new jobs that just never existed, not even five years ago. Like to think that you can have a job as the, you know, social media manager at a company. I mean, that job didn't exist. And so I think for a lot of parents, it's like, what is all this strange bullshit that yeah. goes around as jobs now? <laughs> you know, like, and, and you've got to also think too, like, especially with the, I mean, for me being a woman, like back in my mum's day, not a lot of options, you know, nurse, which my mum was, teacher, secretary, not much, yeah. you know, like, you know, you know, that was about it. I mean, there was a few outliers, <clears throat> but they were sort of your go-tos and then you got married and had kids and you didn't work anymore. You know, and then maybe oh, some women did, but that was, you know, the whole 80s and what you do in the 80s. But and now it's just a whole new world. So I think parents would be just struggling of like, oh, well, whatever. If you want to do that, do that. You know, if that rings your bell and you're paying your bills, okay. I went to uh, as a side, slight side note. Uh, do you know, there's the convention in LA called um, E3, which is like, video game comic-con and yes. one of my friends was playing in um, like this big charity video game event and it was like teed up so that it was it was an actor who was paired with a um uh like a streamer so someone who streams their video game play and, and does commentary on it while All they right. stream it and i met right. the guy who he was who my friend was paired with who would have been in his early 20s lovely guy uh, making a living doing this streaming stuff um, and he told us that the guy who's like the number one person who does this sort of thing for this particular game was earning something like eight hundred thousand dollars a month doing wow yeah wow and it's just it, it sparked a debate between my friend and I and one of his friends you know we're all roughly the same age but about like the legitimacy of this as a profession and a career. And it would be, a, you know, it's, it's, it would be like having the same conversation probably about being a filmmaker 40 or 50 years ago, you know? Yeah, no, definitely. Because it's like, 
oh, oh, okay, uh, what is this? And it's, I mean, and it'll be different again as each generation comes because it's just the new jobs that spawn. I think now it's probably less scary for a kid to say to their parents they want to be a filmmaker because, you know, we see the amount of content that's available. It seems so much more accessible because when I was starting out, you know, everything was shot on film of any legitimacy and the cost of film made it so prohibitive for people. So there was a lot of voices we didn't hear because it's like, I mean, I had to, you know, get funding or fundraise or, you know, come up with creative ways to get some rolls of film to shoot on. I mean, now nothing stops you. You can shoot on your iPhone. Yeah. So were a lot of your earlier short films, uh, they were shot on film? Yes, yes, definitely. How did you go about so, getting getting the money together or get it like, cre- you know, creating the circumstances to be able to make the films? Yeah, well, the first one, um, first shot I did was uh, there was a film and television institute in Perth and they had this uh, scheme called Oomph, which was like one-off members production fund and you got $5,000 cash and $10,000 in-kind support. So I got, I won that um, round of competition and, yeah, made my first short. So that $5,000 was spent on stock, you know what I mean, and, yeah. and, and processing. But I still, I think I approached one of the universities so I could get a discount on the film stock and order it through that way, um, you know, got I think got the camera for free, you know, it was still a lot of approaching people to get stuff for free because $5,000 doesn't go far especially when you're trying you're... to make, yeah. <laughs> and we, especially because my short film was like 13 minutes long set in the seventies. <laughs> <laughs> of course, everything I was doing was like, you know, you could actually, there, uh, uh, there was one film, I think it was my third film, and I think uh, there was, I got $60,000, so $50,000 was a grant, and then I think we got $10,000 from a private investor. Um, and so that's, you know, that's a good, good, you know, good little bit of, bit of money for a short film, yeah. you know, like, oh, okay, no. I decide to make a film that's half an hour long set in the 60s shot on film. You know, like I just kept <laughs> pushing the boundaries of what I could do on the, on the budget. And so every, every version was just the same. It was just like I got to tell bigger stories, but the margin for, for error was, uh, you know, there was a lot of buffer. And... And I think there was just a lot of people that just got excited about working on, you know, productions like the one that was half an hour. Like it just, you, for a second, you got a smell of what it would be like to make a feature film, you know, because you we were shooting for, you know, six days or something and, you know, maybe even longer. And um, it was just, and, and I, I was talking about the other day because, you know, the director, Ben Young, who did Hounds of Love, he was his first job was on that short film, oh, wow. and he sit because his sister was one of the actors in it, and he came on board as a runner, and so I've known him since then, and you know, and it's just fantastic that you know you have these journeys where now you know um, Ben's you know making features as well, and so yeah, that was sort of the craziness of. Um, getting money to, uh, there was a lot of, it was fantastic because there was a lot of support. Like you could, you know, go to places and go, this is what I'm doing. Can you give me a discount? Can I do this? And I tell you, there was a lot of slabs of beer involved. (laughs) Um, $60,000 worth of beer. (laughs) There was a lot of like, thanks. And it was just something that I learned is that, you know, slabs of beer and bottles of wine go far. Like if someone's done you a favour, you know, give them a, you know, slab of beer. And uh, sometimes it was like, that's a big favour, they get a slab of Corona. <laughs> and, uh, and and I think there was just people responded to that, that, you know, it was like, okay, they know we're doing a favour. And, oh, we would call food companies 
like, and we would have boxes of chips, you know, or, you know, things of soft drink. And we, we just hit it every angle, you know. So we're like, how much, like, we would go to bakeries and we would get the food at the end of the day. So we would have day old, you know, pastries and bread and pies, but, you know, we're all like, you know, uh, starving filmmakers. So we're like, oh, this is still good. Yeah, this yeah. Is, you know, <laughs> this is awesome. This is amazing. We can literally cater from this bakery every day, you know, um, before, you know, like you just didn't want to be gluten free, but, um, yeah, it was, it was a lot of that just, a lot of it was just asking people, you know, could you give us a solid and help us out here and, and just think outside the box of like, okay, how can we save on our catering budget because we want to shoot on film? Yeah, that kind of problem solving or lateral thinking is definitely, I think something that you get with, you know, with experience and just from pushing your own limitations, like you say, having a $5,000 budget but wanting to make a $50,000 production or having a $50,000 <laughs> budget and wanting to make a million dollar production. Yes. Um, no, definitely. So you've got the logistics in place. How has your creative process developed or, you know, when you started from your first short through to, I suppose, the honor list, you know, the black balloon you've said on multiple platforms is... Um, you know, a semi-autobiographical piece. Yes. And I know that a lot of your work, you're always injecting your own experiences. In fact, I read something that said you consider yourself a collector of moments, um, which, yes. which I really liked. And so I wonder how that started for you and how it's evolved through to something like The Honor List where you've actually been given a script to direct. Yeah, um, that's really interesting. Like... I think, you know, I learned it almost as a survival mechanism because growing up, you know, I had these experiences with my brother and so I would tell people about them and I, and I think it was like, you know what, if I make it a story, then I am protected. You know, I am not being teased because I am giving the information and so... I would tell these stories, what's happening, you know, with my family and all of this type of stuff. And people would really respond like, oh, really? And I would find people would either care or like, oh, wow, or, you know, find things really funny. And I was like, oh, okay, you know, being personal is not a bad thing. Uh, people do respond because they go, oh, that's a bit different. That's a little, you know, unusual, et cetera, et cetera. And I think a little bit, because I do like to push the boundaries, and I think that just came from my experience growing up because boundaries were pushed upon me, if you know what I mean. Like I saw a lot of stuff that a lot of, you know, kids growing up didn't see, you know, and a lot of things like, you know, when you see your brother, you know, pull out his penis and have a little bit of a wank because he has no self sense of boundaries, you're like, oh, look at that, shouldn't have seen that, mom, you know what I mean, like, yeah. <laughs> my brother's playing with himself, and so, or, you know, smearing shit everywhere, or running down the street naked, or just raw anger, or raw frustration, like, you saw a lot of stuff that you don't normally get to see, and so, in a way, that became, like, my emotional palette in which to paint from, and then... Then as I just started my process of, you know, going into, you know, studying at uni and then really making my short films after I got out of university, it was just, I don't know, I just always found a way into a project, you know, if I could relate to it in somehow. Like, it didn't have to be a big re relation like so for example the first short film I did because I remember going oh, I want to make a short film but I need a script <laughs> I can't write I remember just thinking that like I need a script how am I going to do this and it came to me I remember driving down the freeway and it was like what about that short 
script, I mean, that short story you wrote at university. And I looked at this short story and it was, I did creative writing class and they told us to pull out an article out of a magazine and then write a short story based on that. And so I found this story in like Cosmo or Cleo, which was about uh, women who had babies who didn't know they were pregnant. And so I pulled that out and I wrote this sort of very brecked in short story. It wasn't in, you know, proper form. You know, when you get to experiment with form in, um, in uh, you know, university and stuff. And I was like, and when I looked at this short story, I'm like, mm, there's some script elements in here. <laughs> and, you know, and so my short story was about this girl in a Catholic school because I went to a Catholic primary school. And it's sort of linked with the whole virgin birth, you know, like, oh, don't know I'm pregnant. Here's a baby. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like, you know, we accept this virgin birth Mary concept, but that's the only person we accept it from, you know? And so I was like, oh, Catholic and, you know, putting all that sort of stuff in. And I like, you know, grew up having a lot of problems with the bureaucracy of, um, you know, Catholic thought growing up, you know, like I remember, you know, you get told, you know, you have to be Catholic to go to heaven. And then I remember raising my hand and going, well, what about, you know, what about if you're a good per person, you know, and they're like, no, you have to be Catholic. And I'm like, then why did God invent the Aborigines before white man came to send them to hell? It doesn't make sense. And then I got told, don't ask stupid questions. And I'm like, hmm, you're not really answering my questions. <laughs> I have a problem with this, you know, yeah. and I never believed the very virgin birth story. I actually remember walking to my teacher in grade five going, okay, you're telling everyone this, but what's the real story? And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, Mary and Joseph, they were having sex, weren't they? You know what I mean? And she was <laughs> going to get in trouble. You know, I just had to, you know, and she's like nodding and smiling like, you're not buying this for a second, you know? And I'm like, I'm not, I don't believe it. And so I just sort of struggled. So I put all of that into this sort of um, short, you know, into this short story, which I then converted to, you know, my my short film and, you know, and then it went from there. And so I think all the stuff like, you know, there was one film, the 30 minute one, Pink Pajamas. It was based on my mum whose dad died just before our birthday, but was buried on her birthday and no one remembered it. And I was like, oh, that's a bit awful. Um, I'm going to make a short film about that. <laughs> you know what I mean? So <laughs> thanks mum, you know, and so, and that's where that sort of collector of moments came. Like sometimes I listen to someone tell me a story and then I just call it lighting up. Like someone will just say just one word, one moment, and I'm like, oh, and I just get excited about this little observation that they tell me. And that's what I really love about storytelling is like go for those really personal, specific details because I get excited when I see something and I'm like, oh, that happened to someone. It just feels like there was some sort of exploration and meaning that has come, you know, someone's put a little bit of their soul um, on screen and that always gets me very excited. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I've been doing this podcast for a few years now and speaking with so many creatives in different spaces and different spheres. One of the things that I feel like I can probably unequivocally say, can you probably unequivocally say something? Uh, would oh, be, I don't know. <laughs> Give it a go. <laughs> I think that you, you know, you can only write from your own experiences because that's because you're writing a perspective and the perspective is your perspective. So even if it's not yes. something that's literally or directly happened to <clears> you, you everything's going through your own filters anyway. No, definitely, definitely. And it's what you allow to go through. And and I think um, I was lucky when, um, when I was making The Black Balloon and um, Jane Campion was very sweet and, you know, invited me over to 
her place, showed me her, you know, storyboards for in the cut and just being a wonderful person and generous with her time. And then I was talking about the black balloon. This was before actually it it um it had just gone through Aurora and that's how I met Jane, which right. was in a script lab in Australia. And you know, so it hadn't, you know, gotten the production financing yet. Um and in the black balloon I was sort of putting a few little stoppers on it, you know, because because I didn't want people to know it was my story, so clearly it was, but you know what I mean. <laughs> and and I was just talking and, like, for example, like I made the father a, a, a tradesman instead of being in the army because I was like, oh, you know, I, I can make a few distances from my family. Mm. And then Jane was like, the army is so much more interesting, you know what I mean? Why? And I'm like, I don't want people to do that. And she goes, oh, who cares what people think? Yeah. And just hearing that from Jane, it just gave me such confidence. And I went, and from that, that, from that point, I went, fuck it. And so whenever, you know, I write something or, or even direct something and I, I like to put it in, it's just really pushing the, you know, digging in deep and going, how do you really feel here? And like sometimes if a scene's hard, and I, and I find that with actors, if they're struggling with a scene, is because there's a block and they don't want to go there. And so it's like, okay, how do we move this block because, oh, there's such yummy stuff on the other end of that. You know, that's where the good stuff is. But, you know, it's about, you know, dislodging that block. That's like, no, nope, no, nope, turn around, don't go here. This is going to, no, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. But that's what I love about the process. And I just discovered in myself of like, oh, why are you struggling with this scene? What is it that you don't want to say? And, you know, as I said, same with the actors. And I think that, you know, the best way to work through that stuff is through expressing it or through that kind of this kind of creative process that you're talking about ideally I guess not it's certainly easier said than done though oh no definitely because the thing is is it's like you've got to be both thin and thick skinned to be an artist like you've got to be sort of thin skinned to get in there get all that good stuff out and then you've just got to be thick skinned when it goes out there and just be strong in like, well, this is my stuff, yeah. <laughs> you know, this is what I want to say and be, be proud of it and be like, you know, this is, this is what it is. And, you know, and, and like, and I think that's all you can do as a filmmaker because, you know, you can't, not everyone's going to love what you do. It's just, impossible no one's ever going to do it and that's in every art form you've got people that go don't care much for picasso like myself a little bit of monet you know and other <laughs> people go don't like monet i prefer you know leonardo da vinci or some people go fuck all that i prefer my modern art and give me a bit of banksy you know it's like well you know and it's the same with filmmakers the same with actors so once you realize that okay I can just do the best of what it is that I'm trying to create. It's, you know, it's like with the honor list, it's like this is a film made for, you know, about the teenage girl experience. That's who I made it for. So that's, that's it. You know, like if, if yourself was like, I don't really get it. I'm like, you know, with all respect, that's, that's cool but I didn't make it for you, yeah. you know? And <laughs> and even for the people I made, it's, you know, not everyone's going to go, that's exactly for me, you know what I mean? Like, it's some people going to go, yes, that's exactly my experience, and other people are like, no, I prefer, you know, a film about Wonder Woman. I want wish fulfilment. I don't want reality. So that's all you can really do is just sort of, tick in, you know, dig into what you want to say and who you're making it for and go, here you go. This is who it's for. And I hope you like it. How, how significant do you think it's been for you to, I suppose, especially in the start of your career, to be coming to the table as the writer and director as opposed to a gun-for-hire director or, or gun-for-hire writer? 
Well, I'll, the thing is, I'll never be a gun for hire writer because I just writing for me is just to feel feel fuel my directing habit. You know, that's like. <laughs> but um, happy to direct stuff that I haven't written, and I love collaborating with writers because, and I love teaming up, and that's what I loved about the honour list, teaming up with Marilyn Fu because I was there were so many. Like, and I did the film because there was a couple of moments in there and I was like, awesome. Like, the peeing on the bed scene and when, when um, with the Piper character, when Isabella punches the guy and then her pants fall down, I was like, I'm in. Those two moments, I'm in. <laughs> because they just felt like of a voice, very unique. And actually so many people who know me, who saw it, thought that uh, that was one of the scenes I um, added to the script was the peeing on the bed. I'm like, oh, no, that is Marilyn right there. (laughs) And they're like, what? That's so you. And I'm like, that's why I'm doing it, you know. And we just dovetailed in such a great way. And also the the lead actress, um, Megan Ranks. And so that's really exciting where you can come to the table with very similar voices but different shades and then you can add to that and and build up so i think i mean i'm never truly like i think a gun for hire because um yeah i put too much of myself into like i, I you know obviously it could be a gun for hire for short form like you know commercials or you know what i mean where you're like you come in and you could just go, okay, this is it. But I think when you're talking feature films, you've really got to put, for me, your, yourself in there and, um, you know, infuse it. And as you said before, you know, there's the lens that you see everything through and that's what you happen as a director. But at the same time, just putting elements of your voice and, you know, the things that you want to, share with the audience was there a difference i suppose on that point or what was the difference that you felt because you directed a few episodes of offspring from yes when when you stepped into that world of directing which is so much faster and you are just handed a script and cast and and, and a crew yeah well that was a a really interesting experience i actually had a great time on offspring and i knew one of the writers and got to direct his episode, uh, Michael Lucas, and also uh, got to direct Deborah Oswald, who was the creator of it, one of her episodes. So I got to work with these two amazing writers. And so, you know, because you get, you know, I was, you know, we were able to discuss the script and make a few little tweaks and changes. And, but... It, it's it's sort of nice because I loved Offspring because it was so similar to something where it was like oh this it feels like something within my my world and so it's sort of nice sometimes to come in and it's like oh I didn't have to do all this slog work to write this script <laughs> so it's it's really nice because writing you know of course it's very fulfilling on the other end of it but I find it such a slog because it, I suppose it's my second language. Like I, I think directing's my first language, and so writing's like, oh, okay. So it's just a little bit like, you know, okay, how do I say what it is that I want to do here, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you know, the writer's like, oh, let me try to figure out what you're trying to say here. Okay, you know. So the director part of me lumps all this poor work on my writer psyche and my writer's like oh how do I do this this Mm. is gonna take a minute leave me alone so it's nice when you can have a script that's done and have um someone else you know do that heavy lifting and then you come in and do some lifting at the end that's always nice and in terms of the actual I guess nuts and bolts or nuts to soup uh whichever nuts analogy you'd like um, yes. Of, of the directing on on set or on on a day to day basis, what how did that differ from your experience? What do you mean, like Sorry, from, in terms of being the right being being the writer, or you mean just well, just in, as 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 a different medium from directing a feature film to directing serial television. Oh, back to Offspring. Yes. Um, yeah, it's 
It is uh, different, um, but it's interesting because then when I shot the honor list, I was working at a similar speed. And there's a lot of features that do work at the speed of television. Right. <laughs> and it's like, okay. So, but the thing is, when you're going into like episodic TV that's set up, they're in a well oiled machine. Like, it's not like your day one is their day one. They've been, they know the lay of the land. So you're sort of jumping in and just going, okay. And, and again, it's that little mission statement you make. It's like, you know, this is not a feature film, this is a TV. What is it that you just want to add to it? You know, what is it that, you know what I mean, what is it that you're going to try to get out of it, et cetera, et cetera. So it was, you know, I had like a little set of, you know, goals, or oh, try this, da 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 do this. And, and that's it because it's like, you know, the characters really know their actors, so uh, the actors really know their characters. So you're really just being a mirror for them and going, I'm not seeing that, or maybe you, you know, let's try this example. Like you know, so you you working with the actors is a little different than on a feature film, um, and so you just uh, adjust to that. It's a different um, type of format. Yeah. So, and I suppose it's all. Uh, grist for the mill at some point you know it's all you're all you're just kind of collecting these moments and building this experience to further your craft and to be able to step into different roles and different scenarios and moving to LA I guess to bring the conversation full circle yes between between moving to LA and and starting to find you know jobs like confess or or the honor list were you finding that you were needing to be or appear to be in Australia as well to keep the fires burning there? Or what was your kind of, uh, or did you have a, a game plan coming off the back of the Black Balloon and, you know, winning the Crystal Bear at Berlin and, and all of the success that came with that? Um, well, the thing is I have a number of projects in Australia and I have a number of projects here. I, I very much take it international approach to um, my career and like when I meet people here I'm like hello 40% tax rebate hello <laughs> let's get this happening and no like I'm very much um, international in my approach there is a number of Australian film and television projects that I have and I have projects here and it's basically a taxi rank of you know what's going to come first and and that's what's great of, you know, being from my country and having your foot into another country. It does widen your circle. And, you know, it is a little bit of that cultural career exchange. It's like, you know, getting to meet some fantastic people. But I know all the fantastic people back in Australia. You know, um, I was talking to someone about a project yesterday. And I'm like, and, you know, you know, the editor who worked on The Black Balloon nominated for an Oscar for The Piano and Bez Osmo, who did The Sound, won an Oscar for, you know, hmm. um, Mad Max. It's like you can go through. I mean, and Tony Collette, I mean, she's going gangbusters with Hereditary. It's like, it's just amazing. And that's what's a really cool thing about um, filmmaking is that it is, you know, uh, international medium in which you can work with and that's what I'm really excited with is that you can work with people all around the world doing what they love and what they're good at yeah did you find it a challenge to uh, get your second major project off the ground I know that I've spoken to a lot of filmmakers and there's that kind of second film syndrome thing that happens yeah I had the classic films that got up dropped you know what I mean like I it was just, I did not think this was going to be my second film. And it also came out of nowhere. It was like, like I came to LA thinking I was going to do this. Uh, I've got the classic rejection story. Like um, there was a project with Diane Keaton and I met with, and this was hot off the black balloon. I met with um, the producers and a couple of times gave my take um on the on the script and how I would take it met with Diane and we got on really well and she approved of me and it was like get your ass back here so I'm like oh my god this is so amazing this is how it happened 
happens. This is how it happens. <laughs> and, and then, and then basically the EP, the guy that signed the checks, was like, finally saw the black balloon and said, I don't want this woman anywhere near this film. And yeah. so, bam, bam. So that didn't happen. And then there was another project that I was involved with at Bold Films and worked with a number of years, and that was going to be my next film. And then Changing of the Guard and all that slipped into Turnaround. It has a barnacled chain of title, and bam, bam, that film isn't going to happen. And it's just like, oh, my God, this is just, just terrifying. You know what I mean? Like you spend, I mean, especially with that project, so many years on it, and it doesn't happen. And then, and then you don't even get to keep it. You know, it's not in your back drawer, uh, back pocket, so to speak, or you know, bottom drawer, and you can pull it out a few years later. So, you know, that was all pretty tough. You know, but I've written, you know, there's other projects that I've been writing on. But yeah, I was just like, just not able to, you know, get the projects over the line it just was just the nature it just seems out of your control which is so it's so frustrating because it's like i did everything i could but yeah. it just didn't happen how did you how have you found that you persevere is it just that there's no alternative for you have you thought about maybe i should just go back to australia and and keep working there or have you has that never really been entertained no no, because the thing is, it's like, um, you know, as I said, and I've still got projects in Australia and I don't think going back to Australia, it's about, oh, I didn't succeed. I don't see Australia like that. I see Australia as a co-collaborator in my career in the US. Like, I don't, don't separate them, if that makes sense. Um, because... With that project with Bold, it was going to be shot in Australia, and so I've always, you know, if with with those projects, it was always using Australia as part of that equation. So that was one of those great cross collaborative things. It's, I mean, people at the top of their game have projects fall over, so it, it it's nothing to do with you. It's just the nature of the game, and so. The thing is, if you look at this as a marathon race, you just don't take score too soon. It's like, okay, that didn't happen. You know, I'm still able to keep my lights on and, you know what I mean, and pay rent and, you know, uh, move forward and I've got plenty of ideas. I don't just have one idea. I have many ideas and there's more than one way to skin a cat. And that's the creative pro protest, if, uh, process. If you just think that you've just got this, a protest, the creative protest. The creative protest. If you just think you've just got one idea or one project and if that falls over, that's the end of you, then I don't think this is the right business for you. You've got to be cranking out ideas every day of your life. And it's like, okay, that didn't work. That's fine. Move on. And, and there's always learnings to take from the project. It, you, know, I, you know, if those projects didn't happen, I learnt so much from them, um, from that process. I didn't make them, but, you know, films have a longer life than just the production of. You know, there's a whole life of it beforehand. Absolutely. I think that's a really, uh, a really salient point that we can uh, end the conversation on, I think. Oh, I gave a salient point. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's moments to be collected from each of these experiences. Um, and, and like you say, you know, they just help you with the things that you're going to do in the future. Um, and I really like the idea of setting an intention when you begin a project so that you can have that kind of, that that specific kind of drive with everything that you're doing yeah definitely i think it's just, it's just the one thing that you can achieve that has nothing to do with anyone else and then it just gives you a little bit of i don't want to use the word control 
But it's just like, well, that's the thing I want to explore and look at and that's my mission statement in this project and that's something that you can tend to the fence with because films are so collaborative and so many things are going on and, like, you could have a film release at the wrong time and then that's it, you know, that's beyond your control. And it's like, well, you don't want to base your worth based on something that has nothing to do with you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Alyssa, I finish uh, all of my conversations with the same question and the same segue into the same question. The question is, what makes you silly? I think it's just my DNA. Like, I think I just have a a natural inclination for silliness. Um, Anyone who has worked with me would attest to that fact. Probably anyone who's gotten to the end of this podcast can attest to that fact. I (laughs) <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, is there anything uh, specifically in your DNA you think that, that has uh, created a silly circumstance for you? I don't know. I don't know if I always had it or whatever, but I always see the funny side of things or the silly side of things. I remember like, even when things are really bad, like when my father passed away uh, a number of years ago and then... Um, you know, you know, they pull us out after, you know, they, they let us stay with him for a little bit and then, you know, they pulled us out so they could deal with all their stuff. And then they brought out the special biscuits, you know, that are, in, you know, that are all packaged up. And I just started laughing, going, oh, my God, we're getting the official grief cookies, you know, because it's like when everyone else is there, you get the really dodgy, you know what I mean, you know, big packet ones that, you know, that are... Yeah that you know there's 40 in there and you're going to stick your fingers in but when someone passes away they bring out the grief cookies and I just laughed because I just thought it was hilarious <laughs> so that's that's my little silly gene like my father just passed away five minutes before there and I'm having a giggle about grief cookies so I don't know it's 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 it's, uh, it is the way I'm wired, I suppose. Seeing the absurdity in, uh, in mm. seemingly mundane situations. Oh, exactly. And that's a clicked moment for me. That's like, oh, we're going to put that in somewhere because it was just such a, just such a beautiful, heartbreaking and human moment, yeah. you know, because, of course, you know, they're trying to do the right thing of like, oh, you know, good old, you know, Australian thing, make a cup of tea when someone's, you know, in the shit and things aren't going good and we'll bring out the good cookies, you know, <laughs> the good bickies. And you're just like, oh, my God, this is hilarious. Yeah, unwrap your little grief cookie and you know, have your cup of tea. It's pretty funny. <laughs> it's brilliant. Thank you so much, Alyssa. No worries. Thanks, mate.